Again, you know, tell us a bit, how did you get involved with Bob and uh, what is it working with Bob as a dramaturg? Well, um, I, I met Bob when I was a student in Cologne um, uh, studying theater and I had started to do some small works in the theater in the Schauspielhaus when uh, the great and late uh, Wolfgang Wiens called me and said, uh, I had done a few little works and he called me and said, there is this American director coming. We need a second assistant director. It's too big for one. So we need a second one. So I, that, that was my beginning. I was the second assistant director. And the great thing I think at, for me at that time was that I wasn't totally responsible but I got all the great time with Bob. So I would sit with him all night uh, talking about his past, his work, his ideas, uh, watching him, helping him do his drawings that he was really doing at that time throughout the night. And then the next morning, he was the one who looked really fresh when uh, when we started rehearsal. and. Uh, so this was the beginning, and actually, I didn't finish my studies. I must admit, because I kept working with Bob ever since. And was it in Cologne Civil Wars? Was that in Cologne the Civil Wars? Yes. And then it was the revival of Einstein on the Beach in New York. Then it was the Civil Wars at ART, and and on and on. So it actually from the Golden Windows at BAM, it 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 kept going on from there. So um, working as a dramaturg is, I, I think I would, um, I would say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more the, the, the co-director. I'm working with Bob, but of course it includes everything, um, all the steps through the work. So of course, uh, right now I'm looking at my papers, uh, at Moby Dick that's going to happen in September in Dusseldorf. And of course there is a lot of dramaturgical work and you know how to, to uh, set up. Um, I, I think um, like uh, Conrad was saying in, in, in the title of his lecture that a lot of dramaturgy for Bob is a formal as a formal thing. It's the form that interests him in the beginning to find a system of, of uh, building, building a piece and, and looking at a piece in, in, so that he quickly can look at it. He can, in his sleep, show you the, the form and the, then the structure of civil wars. He can tell you the sonnets where one scene mirrors uh, the first act is, is, is black and the second is white and it mirrors and in the middle it turns. And so, but this is all, these formal uh, devices are just um, a matter of helping him finding his way in to some, into the material and then he can forget about it. So, so that it it just is a, a device to help in, uh, mm. in these structures and this in actually way, stayed in, like stick. in in these many productions that I did. Everything started at a table with a with a pencil in his hand and uh, with drawing a structure of of uh, a piece. And and the form and it is the same. It, it was I, I got a little bit about the uh, Hamlet machine when when they were talking about Hamlet machine. Um, there too, it, it he he built it in five parts, you know. And the first part is the prologue, and the last part is the epilogue. And in the middle is a scene that is different from all the other scenes, and it's the vortex. It's the central. The a piece that uh, is the turning point, and and this this form reappears in many pieces and productions. Mm -hmm. uh, Conrad, tell us a bit uh, about you. How do you experience your work as a dramaturg with Bob? 
Yeah, um, as I tried to, to explain in, in my little speech, uh, I had to learn to think in structures as well, because um, the usual approach for a dramaturg, at least in the German-speaking countries, is to dig up a lot of material and come up with scientific background of a given subject and um, the, the history and philosophy of the time, the art history, or the whole context. And that's not what is crucial for Bach, for, for him. The first thing is always, as Anne-Christine said, to, to bring it down to one line, and uh, uh, Hans Werner also described that, um, and that stick to that simple line. And then, of course, it becomes very complex. But um, at first, you have to find that door to enter a project. And uh, I really had to learn how, yeah, how to, to function in that way. And forget Can you give an about example. What was the door? Tell us about a door in one of the works. Uh, yeah, for, for Norma, this uh, Bellini opera, for example, um, it was, yeah, that. I, I, I try to, to, to explain there is two principles, the male and the female, and they fight with each other. And for, for Bob, it immediately uh, translated into uh, an image, which is uh, a straight line for the male principle and uh, a disc or a, a cycle for the female principle. And I could explain at length um, how I derive that from the libretto and from the way how Bellini put it to music, but that's not interesting for Bob. For him, it was interesting to have that crucial um, line about what it is about and, uh, and then put together a whole universe. Mm -hmm. And something I, I wanted to say is... Um, uh, I always speak of the Wilson family because uh, there's a bunch of us uh, and for each production it's different people who collaborate. But um, once you've done uh, several productions with Bob and you know his language, you, you learned how he works, and then it's very important to connect with the others also, the costume designer, the sound designer, the light designer, the co-director, the co-set designer, and um, yeah, I think all of us who have gone through that experience will never forget. And, and we can always communicate uh, on a certain level be because we have gone through that experience. So for me, it was uh, the experience of a lifetime. I have worked with so many different directors in drama and opera, but Wilson is special and uh, he will always remain. How do you uh, prefer, how do you collect material? Is it image, your photocopies, text, or how, uh, when you prepare for the day in the rehearsal room, what do you guys do? Well, um, usually when we start uh, with a workshop in water, it used to be that way for many years. It's changed a little bit since COVID. Then um, there were the summer program participants and um, everyone was free to uh, participate, as Hans Werner said, everyone is equally important. And then of course we would give guidelines, like um, what would be interesting subjects to collect images about. And then we would have uh, a white wall with maybe 50 or 80 or 100 pictures. Very different kind of stuff. So, uh, everyone can bring something and uh, Bob would then walk along that gallery and pick a little detail from that picture and, and combine it with something he sees in some other picture. So um, a very important principle of his work is also um, chance, to give chance a chance. But it's not arbitrary because uh, he has his intuition. He believes in the creative moment and the creative moment is also um, a moment of a special perception. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's given objects, if you like, like uh, Marcel Duchamp. And that is what he brought to theater. 
he brought this this um, method of using the creative in intuition uh, that is also influenced by chance through his abstract thinking. And that brings a totally different level to the given subject because it's, it's, uh, it's not an analyze, uh, analyze uh, of, of the subject, but it's coming from outside and then the bridges. Because these are fire doors too. We have to move. Mm -hmm. um, and Christine, um, for you, um, what were productions um, where you felt um, this is really sample, you know, of uh, how Bob's work um, um, needs a dramaturgy like you? And what is the production? What made it specific? A, a Wilsonian approach. Well, there are several, but um, I, I just, as uh, Conrad was speaking, I, I remembered um, one of the really early works with Bob was Alcestis uh, for the ART. And, and he was, we were doing the Euripides text, we took the Euripides text and we put it on Bob's apartment wall. So his wall, his, his living room was completely covered in in text and usually what bob does is he creates scenes situations so he would say forget the text and let us create uh what's happening in the in the first scene who's meeting who's there uh, where are we and then you say well it's it's the meeting between uh Alcestis, uh is going to the river and she she's looking at the river and she sees these girls and and then um, he he creates a um, a movement, a, a situation that is more choreography. And then later, you place text where you think the movement is not enough. You 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 take you take the the movement and look at it and. And you, if you see it several times, you see, well, this already tells the story very clearly. I don't need so much text. So you would always say, let's try to use less words, less words, <laughs> no, Conrad, less words, too many words. Um, so so that um, this Arcasis was something where, you know, he would create a visual book out of this text, cut it. Uh, take a, a few words, repeat them, place them in a different in a different direction. So it's it it became a, a visual storyboard, and then um, and or with with um, Wojciech. Wojciech is you know you're really free in in working with the text. So it's you have you have situations. You have you know this is where he's meeting his friend, and he gets he goes mad and and uh, it's crazy and and there's the situation with the neighbor and the neighbor is spying on them she's looking through the window and so you, you have and and there we had um situations and we took as little text as possible to explain or to to help uh, understand the story and then Tom Waits came rather late with the songs where we told him, you know, we need a lullaby, we need this. And, and we also told him situations, Tom. Tom, there's a situation uh, with the two friends. There's a situation where the doctor is, uh, is giving him peace. There's the situation where he's getting shaved. So there's a lot of these, these situations. And then Tom... He he does a love song that's called "You're My Coney Island Baby." So he's he's doing something very different from uh, Georg Büchner, but it's so strong and the text is so strong that you can take really take this song instead of many words of the of the play. So so and so so it's like also Conrad said it's it's um, intuitively or doing it in the moment, in the rehearsal. A lot of the dramaturgy happens on in the rehearsal. It's not uh, that you, you come with a complete ready book and then you say, so let's do this, what I wrote down. Um, it never is. 
So it will always ap appear and happen on the on the rehearsal stage. Even but, but, up I mean, to the, to the opening. Those... It can be on the day of the opening that something yeah. gets... That's well, yeah. I, don't know, but I think it's, it's a great description of it because I think that's a thing which makes it so interesting because it's always about uh, breaking it down to the thing which you really need and to create things which can stand on their own. And if you have... Uh, uh, they can be in different levels. It can be the song, it can be the text, it can be the movement, it can be the light, it can be an object on the stage. But it's always that the things are strong enough to stay on their own. And then you just have to uh, get rid of the stuff which you don't need. Mm -hmm. And uh, this I always found interesting in the... Uh, in the when, when, when the workshop is there. Because in the workshop you really start with nothing. So there is a subject, there is something, and you have the people in the space. And then Bob starts creating. And uh, uh, there is a total freedom, and then uh, the total freedom disappears because then uh, it has to be produced, it has to be done, what is possible, what can you do like this and so. But it's always great to have these, these two phases, to have this moment where, uh, and when you have this in the theater, where really everything seems possible. And it's really true to have this, um, of course, you have this strong energy, which is the center, but it's possible for everybody to contribute which uh, is an experience, it's not a normal experience in the theater. So to, to put it back to it, I like that what you said, to get rid of what you don't need. Um, and um, and everything is a total freedom, and then in a way is total control, you know, which is also a quite opposite worlds. Yes. Um, for the viewers out there or who are listening, if I would like to summarize also the Wilson approach, if you both tell me, are you three about right? Uh, people collect images to the play, prepare perhaps some text uh, that could illuminate the, t the, the the work you meet in the room. The, po the, the, the pictures are posted at the wall. Bob, like a Kurosawa or a Hitchcock, makes a storyboard somehow with things on the stage. Then, inspired by Balanchine, as he said last night, he does a kind of an abstract choreography on the stage. People move, uh, he says, go here, can you please, in, in this kind way, as so many actors said, could you please move there, thank you, make the arm higher. Longer. And there is some kind of a choreography in one week, the next week, the, as Anne Catania said, the text is put on, and then you say, we need it, we don't know, no, maybe you don't speak, it's somebody else. And, um, and then for two weeks or three, you do the lights at the end, the costumes come together, the stage design is ready, and then it's, it is shown. It's a highly unusual approach in a way like a clay artist who puts something together, puts colors on it, gets into the oven, and then you see if it works. Is it more or less fair to say this is one of the way he works? Well, everything except the light is not coming in the last two weeks. The light starts from the very beginning. So the rehearsals on stage. Coming. When do they come in a six-week rehearsal or five? Two weeks or three is lighting. Uh, well, it's um, things have changed a little bit, but um, we you have um, you have mostly you have like three stages. You have a table workshop, like a like a watermill workshop where you like you like Conrad said where you put thousand images on the wall and you collect and you have a group of people you have the dramaturg already there you have the composer sometimes you have the costume designer and and a lot of material is collected for for a piece and um and then bob does these drawings and from there we go to the next stage which is he calls stage a which usually happens in a rehearsal room and which normally happens without text so we know the we know the piece we know the play sometimes it's a it's a play that exists sometimes it's uh, doesn't exist yet so it has to be created but um sometimes it's an opera <laughs> sometimes it's an opera um then um so there is a lot that exists um and then um in in the stage a rehearsal he will already start with light even if the conditions are not perfect if you are in I don't know if you're in Prague under the roof. There is, they still will ask his light designer to bring in instruments so he can create some kind of look. He can create a silhouette. He can create a blackout. He can make, um, you know, pull out somebody. So he he kind of invents 
the peace together with light. So it's it's it comes on really early, and then it once you get on stage, it takes up most of the time in the beginning, you know, a lot of the time, and then once it looks right, then he can listen better. You know, he cannot listen so well when when the piece doesn't look right yet, and. So, so the all the elements. He says always everything is this has the same importance. To him, he says all the elements in theater have the same importance. The the audio, the visual, the um, you know, everything, the yeah, actor I, and the technician I have, I, and everything. I have to say, it's the only director where I am present throughout all the lighting rehearsals. I don't do that with any other director because it's usually it's not, it's not my job. But with Bob, it's the crucial moment when that stage B happens in the theater. If we do an opera, of course, it's not with the singers, it's with stand-ins. But then the, sh the scenes really take their shape. And even then, Bob asks sometimes, uh, Conrad, give me a line for the next scene. And Macbeth, the aria of the lady, it's about she wants her breasts to produce poison instead of milk so that she can be hard enough to, to urge her husband to kill King Duncan. And I said, mm, poison. And he translates it into a greenish um, sort of lighting. So it's, it's really a, a creative process on its own. And um, yeah, the, of course it's very, it's very difficult because it requires a lot of uh, manpower. If you do this, these lighting rehearsals in a big opera house, you have to have the stage for many, many hours. And um, usually it's difficult to get theaters to, to make it possible, but um, that's the only way he can work. And also, something very, very important for Bob, he has to work chronologically. He could never stage The Ring in Bayreuth, which I lately did a production, because there you start with a, a rehearsal on Götterdämmerung Act 3, and next day you do Rheingold uh, first scene, because you just have to work with the singers that are available. Bob could never do that. He has to know first how do I start the, the ring cycle? What does Rheingold look like? And then he can go to Kiri. He, he could never jump from one piece to the other. It has to be chronological. And um, when he does the lighting rehearsals, he even needs original costumes, ideally, which is often not the case because they're not ready. But then at least he wants the fabric on stage so he can know exactly what he's lighting. And so this uh, attention to the detail is, of course, also very, very crucial to his work. How many lighting cues are in in a work right now? Or is there something, a number you could say? At least a thousand or, or more. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Incredible, incredible number, right? Compared to normal stage, but over a thousand lighting cues. Mm -hmm. I think Gertrude Stein said, uh, the more you see, the more you hear. Mm. Mm. This is right, and and in uh, you know in German theaters we don't really have that stage manager system that um, that the Americans have, which is really very effective, where one person really gives all the cues and has a total overview. And in in German theaters is that the light board operator, he's calling his own cues. The sound does his own cues, and then is a stage manager. He sits on stage and he's giving the scene changes or he calls the actors. So it, you have these three and it in the beginning, it's usually chaos. And for Bob, it's we need a stage manager who is American, who sits outside and looks and gives all the cues. And then of course, that way you also, you have a book that's it's very precise and and somebody could take over. In Germany, it, it has happened that a light board operator is sick and it really is a huge problem to run the show because he's, uh, he's more, more or less the one who knows what happens, you know. But um, this has changed also. So, but um, just to see also technically, it's, it's highly complex and, and very, very um, 
there's also dramaturgy with light, you know. Like, yeah, I think uh, this was giving a sample. It, it light, light is 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 very much um, a player in in all of Bob's work. And I think this is something very significant. Uh, what you just said that light and sound is a dramaturgy. It is, is part of the dramaturgy. It is the play. Um, next to text, others also has a dramaturgy of sound, and the sound and light informs the play. One of our grad students, Jessica Applebaum, is working on a dissertation on the idea of sound and um, and light um, as a dramaturgical, you know, serious force. And I think, uh, in, uh, now instead of someone comes in right or left, is the light appears, and then the actor comes, or the sound happens, and then the play um, reacts. Um, yeah. I found it. I found it very interesting and very fascinating the way you, or both of you, were describing it, and it's uh, uh, and came to my mind that uh, what what Conrad said that uh, it really has to be step by step because it has to be created step by step because every decision you take on the stage creates another decision, and this is another decision for the next thing, and it's it can be an actor, it can be the sound, it can be the uh, the light, but it's it's a steady process, and I think that's the reason why it works quite well. Because as a member of the audience, when you watch it, you go on this journey from decision to decision. Mm -hmm. and with some decisions you can connect, with some you don't. But what is interesting is that you are involved in this process of this constant linear writing. Also, this what uh, Angus was describing. Um, and I remember it now, but it's strange that I, how, how could I forget this? That always, and Anna was also saying, always this painting, always doing these drawings in the process when people are talking. Always, there is always a transformation going on from talking into someone which stays there as a fact. It's always about creating facts on on uh, on paper. And this process is really... I think it also has a lot to do with uh, what Heine Müller was always talking about, that so also the play, you write it step by step. Every step creates the next step. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it worked together so well, and both of them were together working. It's uh, what just comes to my mind from... Um, because when, uh, when uh, Bob was working on Hammond Machine, he had this idea of uh, turning uh, the scene he created around four times. So the stage becomes like an object and you as a member of the audience, you can watch the object from the other side. And even if the same stuff is happening in creating the picture, because you watch it from a different angle, it's uh, you see something different. It's like going into the layers of the scene as a possibility for the audience. And at the same time, he was producing in uh, in Berlin, DD&D2, where he was working with this idea of these four stages and the people, the audience sitting in the center. So mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. so these two plays are connected. Mm -hmm. So it must be a phase where he was really thinking about uh, how much freedom you give the audience in following this creation of the work, mm -hmm. of the developing of the pictures. Yeah. yeah and, um, I, I wanted to tell one more thing about um, structure that, um, with with Bob, when we work on a project, many times it happens that the stages are far away from each other in time. So um, we did a project based on the six um, sonatas uh, of for for violin solo by by Bach with Jennifer Ko, the uh, Korean violinist, and we started working on it. Um, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but then. It took two years until we we could get her to come to Watermill again because her schedule is crazy. And Bob just took it up at the same moment where we left it. He had everything in mind. And it's, uh, um, it's because he is drawing everything. And he even writes down the headlines that I give him in his own head, uh, handwriting. If I give him a, a printed sheet, it won't be the same. He has to have the sheet with his own handwriting, and then he remembers exactly, even if it is two years later, and he takes it up at exactly that moment where we left it off. And then, uh, yeah, it was also one of those projects that uh, I will cherish.
for the rest of my life. But when the, at the um, Festival d'Automne in, in Paris, it finally happened after, I think, four or five years of preparation. And yeah, he, he always, like like you said, um, he, he said, I have to know where I come from in, in order to do the next step. You know, I have to know where I come from. If I come from something very quiet, now I can uh, afford to do something very loud. Or if I have had something very, very, very loud, the silence after that is very potent, it's very strong. So I can, I can stretch it. I can allow myself the silence after something like a big bang. Or if I had, if I'm blinded, if it's something is super bright, then I can go and, and do something very dark. So he, he obviously loves to work with these contrasts. Some if, if you know, and, and to build things one, one thing on the next. So, so that, um, you know, that that's part of the, of the structuring a piece. So um, that's, it has to stay in order. You both mentioned the watermill as the creative center for the workshops. I think I once saw schedules. So Bob develops parallel, right? And let's say there are two weeks or three weeks. Twice. How many at the same time? And how does he organize that? How does that work? How many? Oh, you yes, there were 14. Maybe 20 different projects. <laughs> how many? 1.14. 14 okay. projects. And the same week, he worked on 14 projects, one hour well, the next year. Over the course of maybe three weeks. So three it's weeks. but some had a little longer time, some had a little shorter time. But yeah, you you fight for his attention and time because there are teams, of course, teams working alone without Bob, while um, you know, and then and then you always try to get him to come to your workshop because you found something that you want to show him or tell him. And and there are several groups uh, competing for his attention. So it's almost like simultaneous chess of a grandmaster or, you know, Walls Factory comes to mind, you know, where you were producing. But so tell us a little bit. I remember the white tent when I was there. So then artists in residence and actors for the production came or how does how did he put the teams together the 14 different uh, 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 rehearsals well uh, first of all the, the participants can choose themselves what they are interested in and then he always makes sure that um, the, the, the this bunch of people 100 and 120 people from all nations uh, that are gathered for the summer do very different things so you have actors, dancers, you have philosophers, you have uh, carpenters, you have um, all sorts of uh, disciplines. And then um, everyone can contribute what he can do best. And uh, sometimes the carpenter ends up as the stand-in on stage and has to learn the movements because he's very gifted, which he even didn't know himself. And uh, yeah. So it's, it's uh, a very creative atmosphere also because you're surrounded by all these artifacts and, and um, objects of art. Uh, Clifford and, and uh, Noah will tell you about more about it in, in the upcoming days. And it's so inspiring, of course. And then you have that library. I mean, I, I could spend months in the library. So many things that, that he, he gathered during his lifetime, and, and you're surrounded. You can just use everything. I mean, if there is a, a I don't know, a, an Eskimo object that is very precious, that uh, usually would be under a, a glass protected in a museum, you can just take it from the shelf and put it on the table and be inspired by it or something. Yeah, that's unique. And um, in this, also, sometimes you would go around the property, and and especially in the early earlier years when the building wasn't finished yet, and um, and there were there were objects that he had collected over the years, and he would bring them to water mill and place them, and then also these objects became part of the um, of, of productions, you know, so that. He would go around looking for a chair, and of course, 
to choose the chair among 400 chairs takes some time. So then, but then eventually you find the chair and then it ends up in a production or it something similar, very similar will be built. Um, and so, he, so he's also pulling from his own, his own, uh, <coughs> his own property and his own taste and his collection. And also nature, because it's a, it's yeah. a fantastic place. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a, a huge area with uh, woods and, um, he mentioned the Stonehenge yesterday that he brought from Indonesia. I mean, uh, the, so fascinating, all these objects that you encounter by chance when you just walk into the woods. All of a sudden, you're in front of uh, an Indonesian statue representing a, an ape god or something. Mm. No, it's a, an incredible, um, in a way, of like a Joseph Bolz who had the free international university. So it's a center of research, but it's kind of inside a museum, a museum in the museum, in the museum and the landscape. It is unique. And we talked about yesterday a bit that um, his work doesn't get produced so much here. And instead of being bitter, like a Man Ray or others who said, I will never go back. My work isn't supported. Bob's reaction was, I'm going to create watermill. And of course, uh, he is a famous uh, director and well paid, but he's nowhere close to a Brad Pitt or a George Clooney or whatever people with hundreds and hundreds of millions. He's working so hard to make this place work. And it struggled also in the Corona time, but his reaction was to create a space of creativity um, then that somehow, you know, reveals um, um, the, the, the dramaturgy um, um, of his thinking of his work in the real world. It manifests itself. A question, let's say he works uh, with Isabelle Huppert, famous actor, other actors. How are they involved? Do they follow all these steps that the students from a Schauspiel, from an acting school do? How, how does that work? Are they involved in the dramaturgical sense with ideas? I, I can tell you about um, Christian Friedel, who, who in Germany is a very famous actor, and he, I think he's becoming very famous in the United States, uh, mainly through the film Zone of Interest. Where he played that uh, um, nazi guy, and uh, Christian is one of a kind. And in in every generation, there is very few actors like him that match so perfectly with Bob's work of uh, uh, because he can reproduce the form and make it his own. And with many other actors, Bob would always struggle because their physicality on stage is weak. And with Christian, he's always so present, and then he can also do whatever he likes. And Bob loves him so much that he takes much more from him than he would from any other actor. And uh, when we did Dorian, he had this little plug in the ear, and there was this huge load of text that uh, Daryl Pinkney wrote that he put together, as I said, from the novel of... Uh, Oscar Wilde, but also bits of other things that uh, were incorporated. And of course, he couldn't learn all that for uh, stage A when we improvised uh, the scenes. So he had this plug in his ear and uh, the prompter was telling him every single sentence and then he would speak it. That's also something that very few actors can do. And he still made it his own. And then between the rehearsals, uh, of course, there, there was much time when I sat with uh, Christian and went through the text and told him more about the background and so what each phrase could have like um, a mental space behind it and that made it then much much richer of course because um, what Bob does uh, as has been described many times now he tells Christian speak the, the sentence fast or slow in a high pitched voice or low and uh, repeated three times and so on. So he treats text in a very formal way, which doesn't mean that he's not listening to the text. He's listening very carefully. And um, he has this great intuition that even if it's a, a German text, because I translated the text of Daryl Pinkney into German, of course, because it was a production for Düsseldorf Schau Düsseldorfer Schauspielhaus, Bob knew exactly what the phrases meant, even if they were in German. And um, and it's it, 
with uh, with Isabel. You were asking uh, for Isabel. Isabel, for the first time, um, did the French version of Orlando. So the Orlando was done at the Schaubühne in Berlin with Jutta Lampe, and it was a solo piece for for an actress and. Um, and it, this was also Dara Pinkney. It was also Dara Pinkney's text. Yeah. Uh, the and um, and Isabel um, was doing the 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 French version, but the exact same staging. So I I got to work with her in the very beginning um, to go through the structure, the movements, the piece, and you know it was meant to be exactly the same the same costumes the same setting the same light cues the same everything and and still it was a completely different production because of her and because of her way of uh interpreting and and speaking the words and uh and she was she's somebody who was who really likes to take a form you know somebody tells her do this do that she loves to be told what to do, and then she is very free. She will she will not tell you what she thinks, and she will be so hardworking, learning this text and and repeating, repeating, repeating. She really believes in repetition. You know what Bob also says is a clue uh, for his work is is uh, you can never repeat it too many times. So it's. It's something that becomes free after you become the machine. So this is something he learned from Heine. You have to become a machine in order to be free. And and so um, Isabel, it really is the machine. <laughs> she really is. And and she sits in the makeup room and speaks the whole text, which is a two and a half hour production. She says the whole text while she's putting this makeup on. Then you, you already yeah. mentioned the love for, of Bob for old actors like Peter Lühr and oh, yeah. Jürgen Holz, of course, was also an example. And um, when oh, we did this production yeah, of... Yeah, um, there's Jürgen Holz. Yeah. As Queen Elizabeth. Berlin Ensemble, yeah, Berlin Ensemble. Yeah. And when we did a production in Krajowa in Romania, there was a, a huge ensemble and everyone wanted to work with Bob, of course. And so we had that uh, famous audition, which is uh, walk one meter walk in, in three minutes uh, and all that stuff. And there was one old actor who was sitting in the first row of the theater, would not go on stage. And Bob would say, why are you not taking part? And he said, well, I'm very old and my knees are hurt and I, I can't stand very well on stage. I cannot walk and yeah, please leave me out. And Bob said, no, 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 no. I'll put you on a chair, but I want you. And uh, in the end, he was saying the whole text and he was great. And in the end, uh, Bob said uh, he's better than Michel Piccoli. <laughs> and uh, so he can sense the very specific quality of uh, an actor who who has a long life and uh, a certain character and brings all that experience with him. I think there is this, uh, what I always found fascinating that when uh, uh, when Bob develops something for an actor, uh, when he was developing something, let's say for Martin Woodka or uh, uh, in the forest or, or for Howie, it's uh, uh, when he is, uh, when, when he is in, in a good spirit and in a good form, that he really develops it for this actor. And the actor, he realizes, this is me. He's doing it for me. And this kind of sensitivity he has, and this kind of respect he has, especially mm -hmm. for his older actors, that brings this kind of, well, this kind of lifetime achievement, this history of theater, which they bring with them. And uh, he would not ask them what they think in this moment, what the when they do. But he gives them this freedom that they can do this. And of course, he does not give this freedom to everybody. It has to do with, uh, you have to earn this somehow. And uh, I think it's a very respectful way of uh, of dealing with this, with this art, because theater on the stage is this art, which is communicated because it's happening every evening live on the stage. And some of these people are on the stage for 40 years. 
and of course they bring something else with them when uh, uh, when they go out and they put themselves in the situation of working with Bob and find their own place in this and well, that's the quality of it I think but sometimes he goes on stage and films himself and actors learn right the movement they are broken down and Christine yeah well he 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 demonstrate he he will dance I will always say it's a dance that he does when when he's doing a movement for an actor for a certain scene it's like a dance and and you can really see what what he wants to express and he said I don't want I I'm not expressing anything my movement my 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 hand going up is the expression you know I don't usually also his fa face is very still with it he he would never uh, express any feelings or so in his face so it's very um but but like uh, like you said uh, Hans Werner is it's really he has the actor in mind when he does it and he also has the situation in mind very much even if it's also quite abstract this dance and then we film him i mean nowadays in the old days i was writing like crazy and i was doing having a stopwatch and i was trying to write down in what how long does he hold this gesture and how when does this move again and so i i would i would write down and make little drawings and make little and no one could ever read my notes because they were so you know with many little shortcuts and little drawings and so but um we would write it down and then sometimes number he he still loves to number movements so he says uh, number one is uh, look over your left shoulder number two is uh, turn your body the three is raise your left hand uh raise it higher is number four so and and so we have these movements numbered and then later they can be placed in text so he he hates nothing more than illustration so that if if a movement illustrates a text said it's it's boring to him he he really likes to have a movement and a text and they shouldn't sometimes they line up but they can also not line up and then it's more interesting so i mean maybe i should um, tell a little bit how the process works when he stages an opera because then uh, it's just slightly different uh, first of all the structure is given because the score is there and uh, i also had to learn to give him the exact information when he stages a scene he wants to know Okay, this duet is six minutes long. The first one and uh, one minute and thirty seconds is rather slow. Then comes a uh, quick part, and so on. Then, of course, I have to give him headlines: what the characters are telling each other in the libretto, in let's say Italian or whatever. But then he goes on stage and listens to the music and spontaneously improvises to it. And again, it's intuition. It's also, yeah, somehow chance coming in because he may have listened to the music before, but maybe months before that. It's, it's a very, yeah, a very special moment when he improvises these movements directly to the music. And he always says, I don't know anything about music, but he knows music so well. And then, um, the co-director, like Anne Cristino and in, uh, in the opera, it's, it's other people, has to notate it in the score. And then the difficult thing is, of course, when the singer comes in to teach him the movements and to Sometimes arrange it, it, is, arrange right? it in, a, in a way that he can still sing. Yeah. Um, becoming closer to the end of the session, um, a question, maybe Anne Cristino, you're working on Moby Dick, right, at the moment with Bob? Yes. So um, we hear it's how, how, how brilliant it is, the creativity flowing, whatever, but what if it doesn't work? Whatever you're struggling, um, tell us a bit uh, uh, about, about these moments, you know, um, and when, uh, when you, um, you, we are trying to find the right form. Oh, <laughs> there's no doubt we are struggling <laughs> at the moment. 
and we were very much in the in the workshop as as we were going uh, because of course also in this case it's just this enormous material you now so um and and we have we're working again with uh, music by Anna Calvi. Anna Calvi uh, was was doing the Sandman. She she composed the songs for the Sandman, and she sent us songs. So it's it's really like again like Bob likes to 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 create an image um, that places the actors in in you know in a way that you know like. They're they're going up a ramp, for example. They're going on board, so it's a choreography where where the whole gang or crew is walking up the ramp. And so, what is the music here? We need a different music. And then we could never find the right music because we didn't have a song there, but it needed to have some kind of music. And then and then something was played that was very sad and very 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 slow and then he said no but it's joyful they're off to an adventure they they're curious they want to have so so it's it's something gets created on the beat you know on the spot you have musicians there who can who can uh, create some music at the moment or um then you have a light then you have uh, images where we're using a lot of um, video images where you have for for this scene, for example, you have faces. You have the faces of the mothers and grandmothers uh, looking at the at the crew um, saying goodbye. You know, so you have have these um, this illustration of the scene. But the other is very abstract. So it's just a a ramp, and and the actors walking up. But then the constellation. How who is Who's stopping where on this ramp? Who's turning around looking for the next one? Who's uh, walk, walking as a couple? Who is quicker than the others? Who is so? It it just all gets created in in the moment, and um, there are many many scenes and little time. <laughs> to do it. From my point of view, when you are in this kind of process, because. Like I when we were working on the forest, and in the forest there were uh, there were moments which were really great and brilliant and unbelievable, and there were other moments which didn't work because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's in the process. It's uh, things like this happen, and it has to be because it's a creative process. And a yeah. friend of mine, he was a uh, uh, he was a dramaturg in uh, in Bob's early productions. Uh, he's already dead now. He said once uh, that uh, uh, Hans never forget. The dramaturg is the only person in the theater who is paid for having his own opinion and describing what is happening on the stage. <laughs> um, but even if you disagree with Bob in moments, uh, I think that's a great, a big quality that you can say when you look on the stage on something you don't like. It doesn't mean that it has yeah. to change, but you can say it. You can say it, what you think, what doesn't work or so, and it's, uh, it's an open process because it's try and error. And of course, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes one scene by itself works perfectly. It is, it's like a little, its own play. It's like a little play uh, mm -hmm. and then you put it in context and then it's, it doesn't fit in the context. It's too long or it's too complex or, you know, so you only know once you have everything in order, then you know if the rhythm is right, if it, if it works. Incredible. Um, we are coming to the end of the talk and, you know, just to get a little insight from you guys about the complexities, the incredible attention to details, to seconds, to movements, the tiniest things, these kind of condensed worlds that would be on the stage uh, with Bob with custom light, sound, movement, text. Um, it is uh, one of the greatest things I think I've seen uh, also in my life. And um, and um, and I think art, you know, is the expression of mankind, our creativity, our freedom, the observable universe around planet Earth. As far as we know, for some million light years, is dead. But you feel alive. I think the people who are in the production, the actors, but also the audiences, it's something amazing. And the idea and the significance of dramaturgy, with working with dramaturgical uh, collaborators, but also 
acknowledging the geometry of sound, of text, of costumes, of objects, of stage design, distances in the theater to audience um, is something that we that we really can learn. And one day we might have a session, you know, the legacy of Bob, you know, how much of this, you know, can be transmitted to a next generation? How can you adapt it without just copying or uh, repeating something? So thank you all so much. Thank you for the audiences. We apologize for the early little technical detail. Is there an audience? We don't even know. Yes, it's it's a big audience down. online, globally. And, and, you, and you got a little tour behind backstage in the Siegel Center. Yeah. Because it moves every time, Absolutely. so you have a new... I would yeah. have loved to hear the questions of the audience. But... Yeah, but uh, we, are, we are over it. And um, and and I thought, you know, this is a um, will be a good moment. Uh, to um, to end it, everybody hope who is online uh, join us back tomorrow. It starts again um, at ten o'clock, and then from Thursday at two o'clock um, in the Watermill Center. So thank you, everybody, and uh, and if you want to uh, watch tonight, we do have Wilson Productions early ones. They will stream for free. Check out our program. It's tonight and tomorrow. Very very rare. We get the permission to do. So uh, the Deathman clans and early uh, the Einstein, Car Mountain, um, and others. So thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you for having us. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Mm. Yes, wir sehen uns in Düsseldorf. Ja, ich glaube ja. <laughs> <laughs>